Welcome to Utah Stories. Today on the program, we've got three awesome guests. We've got Ksenia from the Nomad Alliance. If you know about Nomad, they are giving all the survival gear to the homeless in this in the encampments in Salt Lake City. They're helping them actually survive this winter, doing awesome work. And following Ksenia, we've got Robin Pendergrass from the New York Times and Getty Images. He's going to share with you his experiences in covering this past winter and and the inhumane abatement policies that are happening here. And then finally, we have Rocky Anderson joining us, uh, former mayor of Salt Lake City. Uh, He was an excellent mayor. I hear nothing but good things about about his uh, term as mayor, and he's running again for mayor. And he's going to talk about uh, a big story that he's actually breaking concerning um, financing of some of this affordable housing uh, shelters that are going out to the homeless. And uh, it's a big story because there's just enormous amounts of money being wasted. And it's really good when there's people out there who are actually following the money, seeing where it's going and doing that work that it just seems a lot of our mainstream local media is not doing. Um, So I want to give you just a little bit of background. I've been following homelessness and housing for the last 14 months. Um, It's a major, major issue that I feel like is really fallen through the cracks of our local media. It's almost like we, uh, our current administration wants to say, don't worry, it's it's all being handled. Everything's wonderful. It's all great. And in the meantime, (coughs) anywhere from uh, 15 to 50 people have died this winter in the freezing cold. There's just not enough support for these unsheltered homeless. A lot of them uh, tell me, as I did, as I reported two weeks ago, tell me they want to work. Um, They would like to take jobs. They would like to get off the streets. They would um, like to become productive. But it's become extremely difficult, if not impossible, to be able to do that under the current living situation that we have here in Salt Lake City. You, you cannot keep your belongings safe and secure. So if you get a job, you'll be punished in that you just won't have your, your belongings there when you get back. And it's just incredibly inhumane what's going on. And so, uh, Ksenia, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, really. It's an honor. Yeah, I'm so glad you, you do what you do. I hear um, that it's just like an unbelievable amount of of help that these people need who are out there on the streets. How did you start out doing what you do and how did you um, get the, the, the organization together to, to give what you give to the homeless? Yeah, um, well this was, uh, we started at the end of 2020 and a big freeze was coming and I just wanted to mobilize some resources and under the pandemic it seemed uh, like a lot of the services and the outreach um, disappeared towards the unsheltered and a lot they've long been treated like um, the underclass like the lepers of our modern day society and so um, it was and I think it got a little bit worse under COVID while the ranks of the population swelled and more and more people were falling into homelessness Um, so we started out just with a Facebook post and then um, 24 hours later we had a truckload of donations and 48 hours after that we had 10 car and truckloads, and then um, I think that from the 12th to the end of that year, and that December, we had seven outreach um, events, just supplying people with necessities to survive the cold. Yeah. And then, yeah, and we've expanded now. I mean, we operate like a mutual aid agency, so we're all volunteer. Um, there's a lot of people that are, you know, that come and serve with us all the time, and we now have a bus. Um, it's a 24-7 warming space. That's housing people, keeping them warm. We feed everybody that comes on board, give them a warm drink. Um, and uh, that's been operating since the end of this January. We have a mass DMV um, a voucher program um, to get people IDs. Um, we're always, tonight, we're taking a nomad, a 62-year-old Navajo uh, man to Vernal because we tried our hardest bottom tickets a Greyhound. The Greyhound never showed up, so... We're just going to ferret him over there so he can get hernia surgery and then be taken care of by his sister who lives, lives nearby. Wow. So, yeah. So you you just basically did a call out on Facebook and just started getting supplies. Yeah. And that's just gained momentum. And, and everybody's a volunteer. Inclu- is that including, including me? Yeah. Wow. Including me. Yeah. And, the, you know, what I find so telling about that is 
we have an enormous amount of money going yeah. to homeless services. Yeah. And I tell people it's anywhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 million. It's hard to track because there's it's so many. There needs to be an audit. And you ask yeah. the homeless people, like, so what are you feeling that that comes to you? And they're like, uh, yeah. I haven't seen my case manager in yeah. three weeks. And Where's the money going? It's like, where is all this money yeah. going? And it, and I think that what you're showing is that the grassroots support mm -hmm is actually more impactful and meaningful than all of these organizational supports that that are that are taking in money i think to pay administrative costs i mean that's yeah. all i can figure out is yeah. there's a lot of administrators and exactly and they're getting salaries and they're getting money yeah and but where the actual money is going i mean they're building housing and where's projects. the impact i mean yeah. there's no fewer people living on the streets than there were before we started pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the you know the epidemic so yeah, I don't understand, and that's that's really the power of the grassroots, like you said. We um, we've been able to fill in. You know, a lot of the population doesn't have family; they don't have a safety net like you and I do. Mm -hmm. um, where you know, if something happened to us, I can crash on some friends' couches or in my mom's house or something if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, half of the population, or half of um, people that age out of foster care end up becoming homeless within the next two years and a lot of no them kidding. become chronically homeless yeah wow. so you know that's just an illustration of how um you know this the social fabric of of their safety net has withered and um government's supposed to step up but they haven't we don't have a safety net an adequate one in this country mm -hmm. um but there was a woman that we found that was eight and a half months pregnant living by some train tracks in a tent um i you know this was doing the point in time count and nobody knew she'd been there um and got, got her some you know um warming gear and coats so and services a few, uh, a few weeks ago and then gave her my number and then she texted me saying oh she lost her mucus plug and i was luckily next to someone that knew enough about what that meant um that told me to tell her to go to the hospital so she went to the hospital kept her overnight and right as she was discharged her water broke but imagine if she'd been in the tent, you know, with nobody around. And then, you know, DCFS, I mean, they, they got involved and we had mere days to find housing and I'd been already trying to reach out and find housing for her, but there was nothing for a woman that was just had a newborn. I mean, other than DCFS taking the baby. Hmm. And so we had a team member offer up a home stay um, for until the end of the month, and then we raised rent money for her for March and April. We um, on this DCFS call, we had also her, and then a backup person offering a home stay, and then a person offering to drive her to UA and to her appointments and get her documentation, everything. And I'm working, wow. you know, try to get her long-term housing, and and DCFS was shocked. Like they actually yeah. said, you know, I'm shocked at the amount of support that you have here. And that was, you know, that was a way that we kind of were able to create, forge a family for a woman that has none with a tiny little baby and got to keep the baby together. Gosh, that's amazing. And no, and so that baby didn't end up, you know, perpetuating the cycle and becoming homeless himself, you know? Mm. So, wow. yeah. And the mama says that she is so happy and she's never been this stress free. And I swear the baby feels it because that's the happiest baby. He never, I've never heard him cry. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's yeah. a great story. Yeah. So you also did something that I thought was quite amazing. Um, while all these people were freezing, we had spells during the winter where we not only got a yeah. ton of snow, mm -hmm. but also tons of freezing cold weather. Yeah. You got this bus um, donated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the back of it is a wood burning stove. And I did some interviews in yeah. that bus. How were you able to secure that bus? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was $4,000, um, but we had uh, done a GoFundMe. Um, I did a GoFundMe a year and a half ago for a tiny house community. So I had earmarked that money aside until we can get something, and this is, you know, a tiny house. We just don't have the land. So um, 2000 of it came from that, and then we did another bit of fundraising to raise the remaining 2000 and then bought a $500 generator and some lights and storage and other things. and. Um, luckily right now, 
uh, for, and for another week, an LDS church is allowing us to be parked in um, their empty parking lot, and the church isn't being used. Cool. But we will have to find a new place to park it um, a week, so next Friday. And you can't leave it west of the Rio Grande where all the homeless people are? They won't. Yeah, no, we were parked there for most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, it, we, and, and it worked out really great. We were parked at a, um, a parking lot, Greyhound, um, right near the, right across from Greyhound until they said that they were doing construction and forced us to move. So that's the, the nice thing about, I mean, it, it is a bus, it's mobile, but it's nice to have stability. And the city just said that they're going to do trash pickup at the church, which is a mm. big deal. Um, so, maybe so this is a this is a vacant. <coughs> oh. Bless you. Excuse me. This is a vacant <coughs> a, a vacant LDS church. Vacant LDS you're... church. Yep. Huh. And so, the, are the homeless people nearby where they can they can get there? And, and... it's six thirty east, one hundred south. Okay. So it's a little bit of a of a walk for them from the Rio Grande area, but it's still downtown and close enough that there's you know resources and public transit and things. So. But it's yeah. it's their safety there too. You know, we can kind of moderate who comes and goes. It was harder on this um, when we were parked on the streets because and things would get stolen. Other people's property would get stolen, and we were trying to really forge a nice community of, you know, moving away from the doggy dog of the street. And um, it's been working out really well, you know, so far. Do you have any yeah. hope that there will be a sanctioned campground anytime yes. soon? Yes, and that's yeah. what we're really praying for is. Um, is to change, you know, the opinions of, of both, you know, the, the citizens and the people that live in houses, and then all those, so the politicians that represent us, rep, rep, purportedly represent every single one of us, mm -hmm. and um, regarding it, regardless of how much money we make. But, um, you know, f even uh, Mayor Silverstrini said he talked to another mayor who said that this, he believes that this is the only real solution to homelessness, is sanctioning some camps and allowing people to actually be found and to receive services, you know, protecting them from the more nefarious interests of the street. Because it really is like one bad apple makes the whole entire bushel look bad. There really yeah. isn't, not everyone is a thief. Not everyone is, you know, extremely, extremely, you know, um, has extreme mental health problems or, you know, um, violence problems or whatever. But, you know, it, it does become... Uh, survival of the fittest. I think everyone operates in fight or flight. Um, but if there was fencing, if there was, you know, utilities and amenities and showers and, um, you know, social services, a warehouse space where people could meet and gather and form community, you know, that just makes so much sense to me rather than spending, what, half a million dollars that we know of just abating this last year yeah ridiculous yeah. amount and and yeah. there's this i think a lot of people aren't aware there is this humongous gap in homeless services from yeah. the resource centers yeah which is to serve couples yeah if you are a couple yeah you are not allowed to stay together yeah one of you would have to go to the woman's shelter one mm -hmm. of you would have to go to the men's shelter and they're at different ends of town yeah. you you would not see each other anymore and so if exactly. you if you are getting your strength yeah. in this in a difficult time you're going through from each other yeah. and your your love and support that's supposed to be torn away yeah. under the current model exactly and, and they and they think they're serving everybody they're not exactly so it's like why wouldn't you understand that gap exists yeah. And there should be sanctioned campgrounds yeah. where people can have their own little spaces yeah. where people can That's remain couples. That's what they prefer. Couples. You know, everyone, I am so against the congregate model of housing. You know, um, I think it's inhumane to expect people to forego their right to privacy, you know, and sleep with 50, 100 people in a room, on a mat or bunk yeah. beds, and then feel any semblance of safety and security, you know. Mm -hmm. And... People tell me, you know, I can't stay in a shelter if I want a job, yeah. you know, because a lot of jobs, you know, like are in the service industry and they end late and they can't, you know, get a bed if they're showing up at 10 yeah. and, you know, they can't bring their things. So you, in order to, you know, you sacrifice, you could you would have to sacrifice all your survival gear just to get a bed, not knowing that you'll have a bed tomorrow night. That just is ludicrous. It makes no sense to me. Yeah. 
you know? Yeah, I, I, you, know, you kind of look at the homeless population, and I think if you're a casual of, observer, mm -hmm. you think, well, why don't these people just get jobs? Yeah, they do so, work. So I examined yeah. that question two weeks ago. Yeah. Like, why don't you get jobs? And, and the, the restaurant uh, industry right there in town would yeah. love to hire yeah. homeless people because you are immediately punished if you try to get a job yeah. by losing all your stuff, all yeah. your security, yeah. you might lose your food stamps, you might lose all these other benefits you're yeah. lined up to try to get. Yeah. So it's like what I see it as, um, instead of climbing a ladder upward, yeah. The system we have right now is it's it's you're essentially descending on a ladder downward. Exactly. And, and that's it's, the only it's way you can go exacerbating and prolonging. Keep going down. Yeah, and exactly. The, and it's just very, very sad because I think the majority of these people, they want to like get themselves up they by do. their bootstraps. They want to yeah. go out and be free. They don't want to be yeah. a government dependent. But yeah. that's really what the system is right now. It's mm -hmm. like creating a whole class of people who are government dependent, yeah. who you are told what you can say, where you have to go, what, you know, you can't take a job. And, and it's just, it's, I, I think the, mo the majority of the public don't understand yeah. that it is such a broken system that we such have. Such a broken system. You know, what do you think is the solution? Like obviously, sanction camps is one thing. What else do you think would be a solution to in the shorter term? You know, I mean, we bought a bus for $4,000, and we've been, you know, keeping probably an average of a dozen people warm all through the night, every night. Mm -hmm. It does not take a lot of money in order to actually affect change in people's lives. You know, when you actually divide it by the amount of people served, the amount of people that know where we're at, they go get hand sanitizer, they get ID vouchers from there, they can come and warm up their hands and move on their way. That, that right there is a very, very tiny investment for all the benefit, you know? And um, I've been trying to, to talk about, you know, building more permanent supportive housing units. We have some, a builder up in Den uh, Davis County who's offering to build storage container studio units with the heating and the cooling and all of the amenities and the, you know, appliances for $30,000 or less if in bulk. Mm -hmm. But right now, I just, I really don't understand this, you know, this, the government model system of rewarding, you know, the, the best developers, the largest ones, the ones that, whose projects seem like they're so much more expensive than anything that people really, I mean, really need. People just need stability. Yeah. It doesn't take much. We have housed people in micro houses um, illegally in Rose Park and in um, Murray. I, we own three micro houses, hmm. um, and I had a sauna too that I was housing. Uh, Barbara, who's now managing the bus, and her little girl, Annabelle, and they moved out of the um, family shelter because the little girl got bit by so many bed bugs, she started urinating blood. And so the mom wow. determined that going camping was safer for the, the family. Anyway, so we moved them in to this um, little micro community, and we've never had more than six people living there at a time. But it was, you know, it didn't overwhelm the neighborhood. The neighbors didn't, you know, I did an interview with them after. Like, they, there was no more increase in theft or loitering. They never felt unsafe. Mm -hmm. You know, I think smaller. I think that is that has got to be the solution. That's like, the if, solution. If, if, yeah. the, if the communities along the Wasatch mm -hmm. Front just said, okay, we're loosening zoning restrictions. Mm -hmm. We're going to hold a lottery. And yeah. a thousand units per county yeah. are going to go up for lottery for ADUs that are permitted right off the bat, yeah. micro units yeah. to to house the unhoused yeah. th for couples, especially with pets, maybe exactly uh, pets. like that. That would mm -hmm. open it up right away. But right yeah. now, the ADU ADU laws are such that you need to go through the planning commission. Yeah. You need to get special approval. Yeah. And it takes forever. Yeah. And it, whereas uh, I believe everybody yeah. wants to be compassionate and part of the solution, yeah. but the government laws prevent that. I know. And I had a guy on earlier um, who worked with under Ben Carson in, yeah. in housing and urban development. Yeah. And he said the laws are written, HUD laws are written, so you would never get government support, uh, federal government support for affordable housing unless it follows all of these rigorous minimum yeah. guidelines, which essentially mandates you have you know, a at really least large 12, corporation, yeah. yeah Twelve hundred square feet yeah. and all these building codes. Yeah, it's and crazy. I mean, just... people were so happy with a tiny little space, but it's their private space. It's a place that they can decompress. There's a lot of mental health issues. You know, people get panic attacks. They 
you know, they need their sleep. It's, I mean, it's that, it's so simple. You know, and another solution, Santa Cruz recently changed their coding ordinances to allow a certain number of like six number of co- num- six cars in church parking lots and business parking lots and then one person to be parked in the driveway of a residential building and living in it and then one tent in the backyard. Wow. You know, that, that makes so much difference. sense. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Moab, we, we report there yeah. how most people are living in vehicles who are new yeah. to Moab, yeah. and they have to live there up, up to two years in vehicles before yeah. they can find housing. Wow. And and just having the ability to camp in somebody's backyard is yeah. huge. It's huge. Or be able to put an RV in somebody's. Yeah, you know, your side. generator won't get stolen, or, you know, you can refill your propane tank. You can have... You can take a job. You can you, you can, can take a job. Be climbing up the ladder yeah. instead of down. Yeah. I just don't. I don't understand this paradigm. Like we we cannot criminalize our way out of the homeless epidemic. We can't abate our way around. I mean, how are people supposed to have jobs if they have to choose between going to work or packing up their whole life possessions and moving because the cops are there? Mm-hmm. And you didn't know there was an abatement that day. They didn't notify you. Didn't say, see the sign. You got home from work late. Something. You know. It's just I. Yeah, it's it's, it's it, so you insane. look as a casual observer like, oh wow, look at all these bums. And you, but you talk to these people, they're not bums. They want to work. Yeah. Most of them, some of them are definitely mentally ill. A lot yeah. of them are on drugs, but they're on drugs to survive. Survive. And it's like you mm-hmm. to to be able to survive in the freezing cold. Um, as we we had uh, Ty Bellamy on, they they use. Uh, amphetamines to just speed up the metabolism yeah. so you're not going to die so you don't feel warm I think if, they, if anybody the were in a situation yeah. where take this this drug or die you <laughs> would probably choose take take exactly. the drug and yeah you so. know someone told me um meth is cheaper than food for twenty dollars worth i am not hungry for four days that would cost me eighty dollars of food from the convenience store wow isn't that mind blowing? Yeah, my, my friend uh, Javi he told me, look, if I get my heroin fix, I, all my needs are met. I am not cold. I don't have to search for shelter or blanket. I'm not hungry. I don't have to search for a meal. I can stay awake and protect myself, so I'm safe. You know, I can keep walking. I can. It's all is needs. Just one thing. It yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah. It, may, it makes so much sense. We cannot criminalize the addiction away. Housing has to be first and. You know, and that's why I'm also a little reticent about um, the other side village. You know, I don't think that people can, that it's as easy as just deciding, okay, I'm going to be sober and then I'm going to get a tiny house and I'm going to live happily ever after. It's, there's a lot of Well, it's a, it's a process. You know? I it's think a process. like the thing that I, I, why I feel optimistic about the village is the other side academy understands it really doesn't take 90 days to get off mm-hmm. a, a substance. It takes mm-hmm. two years. Oh, yeah. And and under that model, you know, they started the moving company and keeping people yeah. to work every day, yeah. which is very good for your psychological health. It is very health. good, yeah. And I think if they understand, okay, this this is two two to three years to get people off of yeah. these substances and to get their mental health back in order, yeah. also takes a long time. And yeah. it's and I think that the the peer support network is is really undervalued just think yeah. you just need a caseworker i don't yeah. think that's it no. i think you need a group of a community around you yeah. providing that support and then i think everybody needs to feel useful and needed by yeah. going to a job some kind of job that they yeah. can prove that they have a capacity to work yeah and so it's i i feel good about that especially compared to these yeah. other models that we've looked at like magnolia apartments we've covered that how yeah. It was supposed to be wraparound services, but now it's just an apartment full of drug addicts. Yeah. And nobody's getting treatment that they need, and yeah. nobody's getting better. The neighborhood's deteriorating around mm. it. And It's really unfortunate. But yeah, but I, I want to have you on with Robin. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a little break, okay. and when we come Thank back, you. you two can honor, talk yeah. about your okay. experiences together okay. in, in covering Perfect. this. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back. Um, so today on the program, we're talking about the inhuma inhumane abatement policy that exists in Salt Lake City. I, I'm getting a better and better sense of how inhumane it is because if you go down and speak to these homeless people, they're not all a bunch of drug addicts and they're not a bunch of insane people. A lot of them really, really would like to get back on their feet and work again. I think that's the big misconception. A lot of them would like to get into jobs, into housing and get off the streets. And that that's really, if you go down and just speak to these people, you'll really find that a lot of them have been unsheltered for less than two years. A lot of them have good, good heads on their shoulders. And a lot of them just say, I just need a, a break from this constant harassment I'm getting from the police. Like they, they'll set up a tent, they'll try to secure their belongings. They'll, they might be able to take day labor, but then the police, if they take a day labor job, there's a good chance the police will come and, and take all of their belongings, anything that was, that was left behind, and then they come back, they're left with nothing. And then they're in an absolute survival situation, fight or flight mode. And then we were talking about earlier how just so many of them resort to drugs to stay to serve, to basically survive. And um, I want to show an image on my screen right now that was taken by our next guest, Robin Pendergrass. Um, Robin, thanks for coming on the show again. My pleasure, Richard. Always, always. We good? Yeah. So describe this image of this young man with all his things. Um, where was this taken? It was taken just a little bit, a bit over a year ago at one of the abatements you referred to. It was actually called Camp Pioneer in Salt Lake City. <coughs> and uh, it was a pretty pretty good size abatement. Uh, by that I mean a lot of homeless folks, a lot of tents, a lot of whatever. But um, he was sitting on the ground um, watching his belongings, his tent, uh, some personal items, some food, literally being scraped away by one of the tractors that was there. And you can see uh, it was emotionally just distraught. I mean, this picture says exactly what he was feeling. And at the same time, I want to point out, and I have it in the uh, image rack, some social workers came by from the city, no names, but they came by, it kind of w walked up to him and they just walked along. However, another, um, um, advocate for the homeless uh, I, I don't know her name but she was there and she sat down put her you know put her hand on his shoulder and tried to console him I mean it was an extremely sad situation yeah and I was there like I am at all of these things it seems like and um, well it's like you, you used to get a 48 hour notice to abatements and now um, it's it's just a couple hours it's They've barely I don't know because Sonia can yeah sometimes they don't even notify him they just show up. They just and show up. Yeah. Yeah. So they've changed their policies they've now. They're just policies. not providing notice. Mm -hmm. And and what you're doing is you're finding out when these are going to happen, and you're yeah. able to document some of that. Yeah. I've got a lot of resources, uh, uh, of course, including Cassania and some other folks. And um, in recent months, um, I've developed relationships with other people that will. Text me, call me, email me, don't forget. And even the night before, if I haven't heard about it, um, they'll let me know what's happening. I'm making sure I'm there. And it's, it's, it's a matter of documenting. It's a matter of creating awareness, getting a hold of how awful these things, abatements, evictions, um, uh, relocate, violent relocation, yeah, one of the senators told relocation. me from uh, yeah. the, the this, this, These euphemisms, like abatement. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, where did they get that term from? Well, they use from mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's mosquito How abatement. dehumanizing, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazingly mosquitoes. dehumanizing. And I want to show one more image. So this is a front-end loader showing up to uh, to Camp Pioneer, right? Yeah, this is, this is an image at the same event. Mm -hmm. And there's people in there that we know, but the point was to stand in front of the tractor to make a point. Uh, were they going to prevent it from happening? No, there was enough cops there. Ultimately, I think one or two of the people were arrested, taken downtown, but they were never charged. Mm -hmm. But interesting is this picture uh, I submitted to the syndicate, and it went all over the country with a... Um, 
a parallel to Tiananmen Square when yeah. that gentleman that's stood in front of. of the tank. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's yeah, what it reminds me of. It says a lot. And, and that that's happening in the headquarters of where we have a church that's giving out millions and millions of dollars of humanitarian aid all over the world. Like this is supposed to be a humanitarian capital of the world. And we're seeing images like this and things like this happening here in our own backyard. What I mean, how is it that people are not opening their eyes to what's going on? Like, what I mean, what do you attribute the lack of attention and the lack of, I guess, responsibility for what's going on right well, here? Well, um, you know, it could be the Mendenhall out of sight, out of mind mentality. But more importantly... Um, the answer is, I don't know when it's so evident that it's there. Now, I should point out, for the record, that I, last August, was introduced to um, an individual at the uh, LDS, this Mormon church, whatever they call it now. And um, he, uh, it was through another contact, you know, that type of thing. And I did it, and, and I think I briefly mentioned it to Cassania, but the point was, he was interested at the time of uh, my plea of, to do something, you know, beyond the Deseret Industries, giving out clothes and stuff like that. So he took it, and I didn't hear from him for a long time, but all of a sudden, I constantly communicated with him. I constantly s- sent the awareness packages, and he got back to me, and he passed it on to two people within the church that apparently are involved in making decisions like this. Well, that was about three months ago, I believe. Mm -hmm. And once again, it kind of goes underground. I don't hear anything. But all of a sudden, with what happened prior to the uh, this NBA thing that took place and how Mendenhall cleaned everybody out and uh, the island abatement that took place, I heard back from him again yesterday indicating that he's still working on it, which I'm not sure what that means. But... um, you know, in its own way, it's prevalent. But I'm, you know, I, I don't hold my breath and I don't dangle stuff like this towards my wonderful friend Cassania to say there's help coming because you just don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know I'm being judgmental to a certain degree, but I still hope and maybe believe there's there's something that may come of my um, persistence with images. Well, I think you you just keep showing what's actually happening, yeah. and eventually enough people are going to become aware. Um, you, you the 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 demonstration you put on mm-hmm. at the uh, west side of yeah. the Salt Palace Convention yeah. Center when the big NBA All Star Game was happening. Yeah. Can you describe that for me? Because I there was something that really struck me with your chanting, mm-hmm. and it was you were started chanting Jesus was a homeless man. Yeah. And to point out that, you know, we have this stigma attached to homelessness and that the leader who, a founder of the Christian faith, was actually one of these people, I think is quite ironic that we all consider, many, many people consider themselves Christians. And here we are just sitting here allowing this to happen. Tell tell me, how did that that, happen? demonstration go down i heard you were moved around by the cops and yeah no like we had a um our our bus actually took a mechanic man, mechanical uh failure um that morning we were supposed to have the bus picking people up and people were waiting for us anyway the um protest didn't go as well as we'd hoped but what was really powerful one what i found uh fascinating is the cops told us to move from vivant across the street by uh the mall because um, the NBA had purchased the rights to all the sidewalks around. Purchased the rights to our public sidewalks. Yeah, to the public sidewalks right in front of Vivint. Wow. (laughs) I I didn't know anybody could purchase the rights to sidewalks. Or or maybe even not even purchase, but lease the rights or something. Um, But, you know, it it was really quite dramatic to see people's faces and a lot of, there was a lot of support um, from the people in the crowd, but then also a lot of people just, you know, walk by and, and, and don't seem to even acknowledge what's in front of them. And I think that's the most damaging part of that I feel like our unsheltered friends face is how often 
they're ignored, dehumanized, people don't look them in the eye. They just, you know, we're so ashamed, I think, and somewhere deep inside of us for our own failures and or and so terrified, oh, that maybe that might end up being me if I don't keep my crap together. You know, that um, we don't even want to look at it. And, you know, for me, for a long time, I was my biggest fear was that I was going to be homeless until I started, you know, work, doing this work and realized, well, first of all, they gave me a lot of urban survival tips. And, you know, and if they can do it, I can do it. And now I have friends, you know, I know that they'll take care of me. But what I found is really, what I found really striking is how often they take care of each other, just like Jesus did and the disciples. I mean, we, they share everything. MJ, Megan Moan, may she rest in peace, who was killed by the cops um, on 111 of last year. She, uh, I was picking her up to take her to work one day, and she didn't have any clean socks. And she yelled through the camp, does anyone have clean socks? And a guy came, walked out of his tent and like, put on his shoes, walked out of his tent, and brought her a pair of clean socks, girl socks. Wow. You know? I couldn't huh. yell in my street and say, I'm not even have clean socks and have a neighbor. Neighbor would call the police on for me. It's like, she's crazy. <laughs> wow. Unfortunately, by the way, I was the day of the, uh, you know, the event that Cassania organized. I was very, very sick. I couldn't be there with the camera. And I know that I missed umpteen opportunities. Uh, will it be done again? I doubt it. But uh, no, we're going to, we have good. to keep, we have to keep putting pressure. Yeah. On you know the only way that any change is ever manifested is when peop enough people put pressure on the systems to change. And create awareness. Yeah. Create awareness. Uh, the yeah. benefit of what you're doing, Richard. Uh, yeah. Uh, the benefit of what the Tribune's doing. Uh, even this Sunday, this Sunday they're going to have an article that um, is about how the homeless were maneuvered out of sight, out of mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. They've denied it. I've had it denied to me by one of her staff, mental mm -hmm. Hall staff. Well, she came out with a Twitter video saying, I know. Oh, I, I would never, <laughs> I would no, never, I would never hide, hide our residents. And what then would you call it then? It's like, well, <laughs> and the crazy thing, you <laughs> know, the, these movie nights, $40,000 and $7,000 in snacks, not one person at the islands, the largest camp at that time, was invited to go to any of these, you know, oh, really? extracurricular you know, watching the game activities. I never, I, I heard that they were going to yeah. happen, but uh, I thought yeah. that they bailed on them or something because I never, I, never uh, purp I don't know. Purportedly, I think someone's pocketing money at this point. So. Well, yeah. they, they had you them, know? but, you know, reflecting, these are human, they're real human beings. Yeah. And every time I visited that, this, whatever, and you interact, you get to know them, um, you know, how is it possible they can be ignored, not respected, not di dignified with something like a, a porta potty? Mm -hmm. But they're just trashed aside and and dealt with like like uh, yard yard goats. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just it's awful. Well, I and I was thinking about how every time a city has boomed in population, the homeless population has also increased significantly. And I'm I'm kind of studying the the New York City at the turn of the century. Yeah. Their population increased enormously in the years between 1900 and 1920. And how did they deal with it? Mm -hmm. The 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 major thing that really alleviated the problems were that they had tenement housing, yes. which is illegal here. Yeah. They they allowed for. Um, slums to exist for, yeah. for periods of time yeah i mean just just houses. understanding people need to li yeah. live somewhere live somewhere they, they weren't being harassed like these yeah. these new immigrants that were coming over from from places like ireland and 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 uh italy uh they they wouldn't say oh you can't stay here you got to leave and and then not let them they, they tried to create a ladder that they could climb yes. and that socioeconomic ladder yes. i feel like is is always been the key reason why people come to the United States yeah. is they feel like they ha they can climb their way up and out of yeah. poverty. And do you think that that's that's just becoming endemic across cities across the United States yeah. that we're just we're just ruining that ladder? It's not I think this is anymore. late stage capitalism manifesting, you know. Well, it's I'm a, a Mar it's I'm a hard. Marxist a little bit, a socialist a little bit, the good kind. And you know, Marx did predict that, you know, eventually capitalism would run out of fuel, you know, it's well, a hungry, it's like hungry beast a, that always needs to eat. A democratic republic can yeah. exist unless the majority of people 
care about the poor. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Unless we understand, we have to be all in this together. Yeah. And if you just just decide, oh, we're going to disregard this lower class of people, and we're going to just let them be dependents, and and not let them climb a ladder, and and say, no, you're you're not good enough, you're not capable enough yeah. to be a part of the free market. Then of course you're going to look at capitalism like it's major majorly flawed yeah you know i have i have of course uh, and you're going to opt out which a lot of them you know kind of have in a lot of ways yeah i want to talk about that more. you know as a as a footnote um i think it it, you know i've invited myself and kasanya has and other people have to the supply drops that are staged by Mm -hmm. nomad alliance Mm -hmm. last sunday or two sundays ago uh, no, last bought, Sunday. Uh, yeah. Last Sunday, number 58, five, eight of these things. And if people would show up, uh, maybe contribute whatever they could, whether it's money or socks or food. A side dish, yeah. If, uh, <laughs> exactly. If, if they showed up and saw, number one, the, the, uh, the quality of the volunteer efforts, the quantity of the volunteer efforts, and then the literally hundreds of people homeless folks that come that are, are valued by their presence and they're valued by the opportunity to get some clothes, get a decent meal, to sit down and, and you know, share some, um, uh, you know, talk, just some talk, some respectful yeah. talk yeah, with fellowship people. Fellowship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it's unbelievable. 58 of these things. Yeah. And I don't think yeah, it's happened anywhere like this yeah. in the country. Yeah. Right here in Salt Lake City. I, I, I think thing. that here in Salt Lake, we have very, very generous people. We do. We have a population of people who, who see people in need and they want to step up. But I see what's deficient is people not wanting the homeless people or a camp or yeah, a NIMBYism. center in their backyard. Yeah. Correct. Like you, you yeah. do, they don't want to and step up And that's the disconnect because we're a liberal you know, city, we're purportedly supposed to take, you know, care about the poor and the more, most marginalized among us. And I don't understand why we're so, like, reluctant. horrified and reluctant. reluctant to think about people from this echelon yeah, oh, living oh, there might near be a us. Camp, a quarter mile from my yeah. house? Oh, no, 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 no. But I'll, I just I'll found out there's an app a, that allows you to tattle on where unsheltered people are camping and what they're doing. Really? Wow. There's an app now. Today I read in Reddit... Yeah. This morning, before I got here, the situation in San Diego and San Diego County and Carlsbad, where the folks in Carlsbad, which is kind of an uppity-up community, um, placed all the homeless people, bought them bus tickets, back to some homeless you know, areas in San Diego to get them out of their community. Get them really? out. They didn't give them box lunches. They didn't give them a jacket. They didn't give them a blanket. They gave them a ticket because that was uh, how they handle the problem yeah. in many ways. Happened to us, like Jacksonville shipped some people here, Yeah, and yeah. Sounds uh, like Provo Martha's does it regularly. When they had the, the immigrants show up there. Yeah. They were like, of course. yeah, well, we want open borders, but we absolutely don't want them here. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's just this extreme nimbyism that Extre- occurs everywhere. Yeah, and disconnect between you know their words and their practice. I don't understand that. So yeah. And well, to treat people like my in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't know his name. I haven't seen him around. A lot of people we see again and again. Yeah. But I haven't seen him. But that's why that that particular image, if it receives the accolades that it might, it could be a real emblem emblematic of 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 a statement of uh, inhumanitarian ways of treating the homeless in Salt Lake City. Yeah, and and one thing in the abatement I went to with you. That, uh, that she didn't want to be on camera, but a woman who was like six months pregnant, yeah, and she was there, you know, trying to deal with this crazy situation where she thought she had found some security in this little camp, which is off out of the way. I don't think there were any complaints. It was yeah. Union Pacific property. Correct. Yeah. It was a great little camp. Great location. And for they're it, yeah. and they're just getting it all abated, all cleaned out. Instead of providing a dumpster and a couple porta potties, which would probably be a couple of thousand, less than five thousand. They're probably spending ten thousand on having exactly. the police and health department show I up and debate. I don't understand. Them. Doesn't make any sense. At and the, we're supposed to be a fiscally responsible state too. Where, why aren't we? Right, you know, right. l- uh, running the numbers. It is much, much cheaper to house someone than it is to keep them on the streets. Yeah. You know. You know I mean, was, what we we found a, a guy it, sorry, staying. I mean, 
one of our, our bus um, inhabitants, he found a man sleeping behind a dumpster the other morning and brought him into the bus to you know warm frozen. up. Completely frozen, hypothermic, mumbling, um, you know, completely disoriented. And then um, the next day, uh, Robin called an ambulance, and, and he's in the burn unit now because of the ex- extreme frostbite. Wow. You know? Jeez. So imagine, you know, in how many days he's going to be in the burn unit, and they may have to amputate some toes, and how much money that costs, you know, our emer- emergency medical systems and the ambulance ride and all of these things, rather than just giving someone a place to go. And shelters are not it. You know, in this bill 440, 499 that recently passed, that, you know, enacted Code Blue and other things, really, really happy about the Code Blue dynamic, but, you know, I still don't believe it's humane to force people to go into places where they don't feel safe, where they're separated from loved ones, from their pets, where things get stolen, where they, you know, there's such stringent rules and, you know, staff that, you know, make them feel like they're small and insignificant. Nobody wants to be in that situation. Of course, people would camp. I would rather camp yeah. if I was out in the streets. There's it, no way. Especially if you got if you yeah. have a pet you love yeah. or a partner you love. Yeah. You're, there's no place for you. No way. Like, and I couldn't sleep with a hundred other function. women. The other night no way. at the final uh, movie night, is that what they call it? Mm-hmm. The other night at the First Methodist Church, there was a couple in there uh, overnight with a three-month-old baby. A three-month-old baby. I haven't released the photos yet, mm-hmm. but they were so thankful that somebody cared. It could have been anybody. They could have found their way to the bus, too, yeah. mm-hmm. easily. Yeah. But there was something available, unlike a lot of cities, where, yeah. like in Carlsbad or whatever, here's your ticket. Get out of yeah. town, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Get out of town. We out of s- sight, out of mind. We had a 16-year-old on the bus the other night. Did you? 16-year-old no child, yeah. Was it a boy or a, a girl? Boy. Wow. Yeah, I I met a um, young lady, probably in her early 20s, yeah. and she told me, I said, how long? I usually ask, how long have you been yeah. on the streets? She said, oh, five years. And I says, you look like you're 20. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I, I came out here when I was 18. And yeah. she had been, um, she didn't go into the details, but she'd been abused severely yeah. a lot of them are runaway kids running fleeing from you know a, f- a familial abusive situation or women fleeing domestic violence situations or you know even men being abused you know in foster care situations a lot of that you know because the streets are what a metaphor some way. for humanity the blue yeah. bus the blue love bus <laughs> what a metaphor for yeah. humanity in salt lake city thank you mm-hmm. it's so Simple, the concept, Mm -hmm. little heat, some blankets, Mm -hmm. warm air. And no draconian rules. We don't search bags. We don't force people to be in at a certain time or be out and up at a certain time. Can people keep the belongings secure, us on the bus somehow? Yeah, Yeah, they bring them on, don't Mm -hmm. they? Yeah. Yeah. they got to take them with them when they leave. Well, it seems to me if – so I I get that a lot of homeless people, they blame um, capitalism. Right. Mm -hmm. And I and I see that's that the capitalism has failed. But then I I look at the other end of it. Um, You go to Wyoming. It has far less population, far less capital. Why aren't why aren't homeless people going to the less populated regions? Why are they? We just got a a whole bus of, of people from Jacksonville shipped here by their mayor. Really? Yeah. That's the thing is we, like those, we think that they're congregating here because we have the services. We have right? the services and they hear about the services. But I think that, I don't know that the services would even be available if it weren't no. for, for capitalism. No, I mean, that's not, why I, no, not necessarily. I mean, the thing is, is there's I my mom cried the first time she found uh, she saw someone homeless in Russia. And this was in ninety nine. We left at the end of ninety three and she had never seen someone sleeping on the streets in her country. And so, you know, that was why we have those big, you know, ugly cinder block apartment buildings because housing was codified in our constitution. And so we just mandate, we just erected all these apartment buildings, no, no matter whether they looked pretty or not, but at least they were keeping people warm and off the streets. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so, I, I think that there, there needs to be a minimum sense of housing. But I, I mean, I had on the Pioneer Park Coalition new director 
Paul Webster yeah. earlier today. Yeah. Um, really smart guy, yeah. policy analyst, really understands why and how things are the way they are concerning homeless policy. And really what, what I feel like is missing and what he says is missing is that we the housing component is one silo yeah but if you're not dealing with the drug and alcohol addiction component as well as the mental illness component mm -hmm. the housing is just not serving the needs of the people the housing is is as we've seen from like palmer court in magnolia mm -hmm. that's just essentially putting up people who are mentally ill and addicted to drugs and it's deteriorating the neighborhoods all around those housing units. So if we just provided more housing, yeah, that's that's one silo you're solving, but it seems like just as big of a problem of, as, as housing is the drug addiction and the mental health yeah. components. And so it's like, how do you deal with those? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like a big part of the problem are the government solutions. Like they create- or lack thereof. Well, the, the government deciding, Oh, we're going to be the ones providing the housing yeah. instead of just That's laxing it. zoning yeah. laws. Allow yeah. the free market Why to provide we, the zoning. Why can't we? You know, have nomads housing? build a bunch of tiny houses. Exactly. And you know, live you'll in a go, community. You get a piece of property and not have strict zoning <coughs> laws. <coughs> yeah, to we build can fundraise for private tiny... property, and we can't actually even do that, even if we got land donated without the zoning. You know, because who wants to be under the government's changed. thumb? Yeah. I don't. I see a lot of these homeless people. I had a guy tell me he was like 60 years old. Yeah. He said, I stay at Grace Mary Manor, but I'm I'm a homeless man. Yeah. That is not my home. Yeah. I cannot claim that that roof yeah. over my head is anything like a home. Because I know if I say something wrong, well, they'll kick me out. Yeah. I, I'm going to be I'm going to be out back on the streets yeah. if I don't do what they want me to do. You know, you yeah, mentioned the so government sad. and yeah. I, I reflect on this all the time because Sandy's heard it a few times when Cox was elected governor of our state. He one of the things he did of short maybe a month or two after was created a homeless committee 27 people 27 i don't know who they I didn't were even know about this or mm -hmm. oh yeah oh. and if you go back and i you know, because of my involvement with the homeless in my way i latch on to stuff like that mm -hmm. and to this day as far as i know they have never had one meeting get together free lunch whatever it is where they sit around a big table mm -hmm. and talk about who knows what or why but you know that was that was again some kind of a a symbolic move like, like the homeless task force of probably course, like of the course. Wayne Niederhauser homeless task force of, of like course. what are you actually doing and what are you accomplishing but then, then you invite them out to a supply drop I'm as you can see I'm a real advocate yeah. mm -hmm. of that and see these folks homeless folks coming uh, saying thank you, they appreciate it. Yeah. Um, standing there to enjoy a meal, sitting down, getting a pat on the back, getting a hug, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, you know, come on out. And we've had a few politicians. Yeah, I mean, we has. do these um, speed chats where we have people do rotating conversations with. Um, we usually would like to have a city council person and someone from the state legislature, um, so that they can you know ask some questions about policy and how we, they can improve homeless policy, um, which has been really quite revolutionary and really yeah, Analia awesome. Valderamos came to the last supply drive. That's great. Um, if you can actually get yeah. the political leaders involved yeah. that and actually talking to the homeless, yeah. that's what I think is missing. That's what's missing. So, they so all Mendenhall just, you know, said recently, yeah. I spend more time thinking about the homeless situation than any other issue why there is. Why isn't she doing anything? And I was anything? like, why don't you stop thinking yeah. about and it? Just Actually and talk to action. the homeless people yeah. that are on the streets. Come out. Come. I, I really urge Aaron Mendenhall to come out to our supply drives and participate in these speed chats because, you know, you need to know how who these people are in order to enact, you know, policy. Policy, you can't, if you actually knew how amazing they are, do you know them? Like Silence, for instance, he was recently housed, has 187 IQ. How many people I meet on the streets that are such geniuses, mm -hmm. fine line between genius and madness, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I always wonder how many Einsteins are out there, you know, languishing and yeah. not and, creating. And human resources. Human resources. Like it's, it's a little dehumanizing to call yeah. somebody a human resource, but at the same time, Talent, restaurants genius, are so books, in need models, of staff. Whatever. And I yeah. make it a point exactly. on my thread that you're on, and of course, Cassandra is, but 
uh, there's probably eight or nine politicians that I've interacted with, including uh, uh, Steve Eliason, but his colleagues in the House and the Senate, that I make sure the awareness is there. Oh, by the way, this happened this week. Yeah, that's and, great. And uh, it, it's critical, from my perspective, just not to let the opportunity to share even an image or two. They may not look at the whole file. I understand mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But even the, the, you know, the photo that you put up today will be sent to them at some point after it it's qualifies completely for the Pulitzer. But uh, it's going to be important to these people. And you know some of the folks like Galen and others have, uh, I think, paid attention, don't you? Yeah. You know? They've been, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to take a little break, and um, when we get back, we're going to have on the show uh, former mayor and new mayor uh, candidate, Rocky Anderson. He's going to talk about his ideas and, and some really interesting things he's dug up concerning homeless spending. Like, we, we've been asking the question for a long time now, where is this $250, $300 million going? Because there's a lot of that big pie that is not accounted for and we're going to get some answers from him coming up. So, and we'd also love to hear from you. So if you, any of you watching live right now want to chime in, you have any questions or comments, uh, let us know. We want to read those and uh, have you be a part of this as well. So we'll be right back.
All right, we're back. Um, I want to start the show with a video of a homeless woman. This video was taken by uh, Rocky Anderson. I just want to play it. And can we make it so we can hear it, Troy? Yep. We're, uh, we're going to play it on air live when we're ready. Let's. Uh, I'm videotaping this. I'm Rocky Anderson. Is it okay if I get this out to the public during the course of my campaign so people can see what you're going through? Yeah, I mean, there's, okay. there's got to be a better way to do this. I mean, they come in here and they just start scooping up our lives like it's yesterday's trash. They don't care that this is all we have and we have nowhere to go. Um, all the shelters are pretty much always full. Um, a few years back, they did hotel vouchers, but they didn't seem to do that this year. So, uh, have you been told you have to leave here today? Yes, we have. And you're on the island? Yep. On 5th West, below, just west of the Rio Grande Depot? Yep. And uh, you've been told you have to get out of here today? Yep. And, and I'm just trying to have a, a warm place to sleep, you know, somewhere to be out of the weather. Did anybody give you any alternative? Nope, they did, never do. Did they tell you they anywhere just come else? In, they just come in, tell us that they're coming in to clean up, pack it up, and get what you get what you need to get and get out. That's all they do. And have they taken your property before? They have, yeah. I've and lost a lot. Has the ACLU or anybody offered any legal assistance? Nope. Okay, so I'm just taking some photos. It looks like there are a lot of people encamped here today. A lot. to the end up there and if you had some indoor place to go would you go oh definitely definitely it's been miserable this winter yes, hasn't it's it? been horrible so uh what what would you like to do better housing i, I would like it to be a little easier for us to get into housing i mean they say they're building all these apartment complexes that are supposed to be low income but we can't seem to get into them. And uh, at nights, you're not able to get into the overflow shelters? No, I sit in this tent and I burn sanitizer to keep warm. You burn sanitizer? Yeah. And that's that can be kind of dangerous, but you just have to be very careful. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? I'm 51. You're 51? I'm retired, I'm on disability. Um, I have a source of income. I just cannot find an apartment. Did you work before? Yeah. Where did you work? Um, I've done a lot. I taught preschool. Okay, we'll pause it there. Um, so this was during the, the abatement that happened just five days ago. Is that right? Uh, I don't call them abatements. I think that's a dehumanizing term. That's something yeah. that the city and the county call them. You abate mosquitoes. You abate nuisances. You do not abate human beings. You yeah. raid human beings. You confiscate their survival gear, their tents, their sleeping bags, their blankets. That's what has been happening under Mayor Mendenhall's administration. This is coming directly from her. When I was down here, this was just a few days ago down uh, at West Temple, or Fifth West, rather, just west of the Rio Grande Depot, uh, I asked some police officers, have you told them, as you're pushing them out of here once again, and there's no room in any of the shelters, have you told them any alternative place they can go? One of the officers looked at me, shook his head, and he said, you're going to have to ask Mayor Mendenhall. This is coming directly from her. We're using Salt Lake City Police. We're using Salt Lake City Streets Division employees and equipment. And I've got some, some video here, uh, and this was down at the Spaghetti Bowl at an earlier raid, where they came down and grabbed with the heavy equipment somebody's full tent with all their property in it, picked it up. The, the guy that's driving it has a big smile on his face. He would have been great in, the, in concentration camps in Germany and elsewhere. And it swung around, and he, they dropped it in a truck. 
This this is this is first of all, it's environmentally just disastrous practices. Mm-hmm. It's utterly stupid. This this is equipment uh, and clothing and tents donated by good-hearted people, collected by people in these different organizations like Cassinia Nomad Alliance, like Coco at Coconut Hut. So many good people doing this work, and it gets out to the people that are intended to be helped and then Salt Lake City employees and our contractors, Advantage Services and police, they come along and push them out and as Captain Diamond was quoted in the newspaper is saying, we know when we go in to push them out of these areas that they have no alternative and wherever they end up will probably be told to clear them out of there also. What utterly inhumane wasteful, uh, cruel practices. And this is coming straight from Mayor Mendenhall. The buck not only stops with her, we know that this policy is driven by her, and yet she'll go out in the most hypocritical fashion and talk about how much she loves the homeless. She does her little photo ops. Well, the other day she was doing a photo op having a cup of coffee at some coffee shop puts it on social media at that same time her police city contractor were down clearing people out once again from their encampments and at that time i found a man who had horrible frostbite and trench foot and i took him up to salt lake regional hospital where they treated him very well did a lot of cleaning did a lot of work and now, now it's a matter for him to get self-care. But you look at this, this would never have happened had we had adequate shelter for people who are out in the freezing cold. And yet, what did the Salt Lake City Mayor ask the council to do? And the council lined up dutifully and did it. They prohibited any more shelters in Salt Lake City yeah, with this moratorium. freezing killer cold coming on. And so it's left for volunteers and nonprofits to put together, along with one church, the Methodist Church, mm-hmm. to open their doors. And I volunteered down there a number of times. I was there just the night before last, over 80 people coming in, finding food, warmth, and a place to stay. But they had to get around the city ordinance by calling it movie night. And they show a movie up on the wall. Nobody watches it. Oh, that's the reason. It's just total pretense (laughs) to get around this insanely inhumane (laughs) policy of Salt Lake City government. It's like the the euphemisms and the gaslighting, the, the idea that this is abatement, we're just oh. move, we're moving we're scooting them we're trying to just move them into the shelters the resource centers. There are no shelter beds. There, I've established that. Yeah, I there's call. no there's no space. No. And and so I I just had on this morning we're going to show this interview after this one um, a representative from the the new Pioneer Park Coalition is called Utah Solutions now. Right. Um, he's a Washington policy uh, person. He worked under Ben Carson. Under, under we spent an afternoon together. We oh, had lunch, good. and I took him around and showed him. What yeah, I he he's, he's, a, he's a he's a he's a smart guy because I think he understands the problem with the housing first model that exists here in Salt Lake and why it's become such a failure and why those dollars could be such so much better spent if you if you help people with their recovery of addictions and their their psychological disorders and you provide basic necessities instead of uh, like the Magnolia, this this sort of two hundred sixty three thousand dollars a unit. Yeah, that's a Magnolia. Where you could, how much would a tent cost on a piece of Union Pacific property? Exactly. Well, and it's like to have a cost par- comparison analysis of what you could get per dollar spent. That's not happening anywhere in Salt Lake. And this two hundred fifty million to three hundred million dollars we're spending per year, like that was really uh, telling when you when you tell this woman. Um, did you, did you, are you told where you can go? Are you told where, what your next steps are? They're not being told anything. Why aren't you spending some of that money to tell this woman where she can possibly go so she doesn't freeze to death? And, and any successful program, and I've been to those programs, unlike the mayor who in nine years in, in elected office has never been to a model homeless project in this country. 
I've, I've visited these places. I've gone down, for instance, Haven for Hope in San Antonio, mm-hmm. Community First Village outside of Austin. Uh, I've researched these. There's not a successful program that doesn't have intense case management mm-hmm. where you keep track of every single person mm-hmm. with their consent, of course, and help them out and have a case management plan. What is it that you brought that brought you here? Do you need drug uh, substance abuse treatment? Do you need <coughs> mental health treatment? Do you need Homeless just to, mm-hmm. just to get back? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on your feet and get a job. I met three people the other night at Methodist Church. They were so proud and, and happy about just landing jobs. One of them got a job at the airport. She's been out there homeless all winter long. Mm-hmm. She's going to have a $16 job, an hour job at the airport. Another one got a job at the Wigan Center. Absolutely thrilled. These people take pride and having work, the dignity of work, but nobody has been out there providing job services for them. All we've been doing as a city is moving them around in the cruelest, most traumatic fashion possible. Sorry about that. I mess up my mic by gesturing. Oh, you're good. (laughs) Um, So if you would. Well, that's, I think that's a big misconception. And I think that I don't know if it if it's um, a mindset or the media or just the imagery you get from the mainstream media, you 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 get the sense from the most of the images you see that these are drug addicts, that they're oh. they're people who who don't want to work, they're bums. But then once you go out and you talk to them, once you get to know them, you realize no, these people want to get off of the streets. They don't want to stay in this situation. Virtually everybody. There, yeah, there, there are a there's a few exceptions. That are, there are some that that, that uh, have become used to their lifestyle and what. But yeah, I, but seven very, out of ten, I would yeah. say, are, are really eager to do whatever they More could to get that. out of the street. Of you find that they don't want to be out there in yeah. the freezing cold. Well, I just wanted to mention Megan Moan. Um, I s- try to mention her name as much as I can. She yes. was brutalized by the police. Um, she but was this killed is, by the police. Yeah, she was killed mm-hmm. by the police. Um, this is a micro house that I bought for uh, $300. Oh, that's a micro house. Yeah, wow. a micro, micro so house. Right. Um, yeah, I'll hold it up. It's, it's, it's really little, um, but it's, you know, it was, it gave her so much stability. She had been homeless for six years. Um, and uh, she had a boyfriend that was um, uh, beating her, and so we moved her there, kind of to provide a little safe house for her. And um, she, we got her a job at Zest. She kept that job for the entire time she was housed in this little community, um, illegal community. Uh, month three, she realized, she told me she realized that she didn't like how meth made her feel, and she stopped using entirely. Um, she, we were doing workshops, empowerment workshops, teaching meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy and self-defense. Every Wednesday she would come to every single one of those. You know, she was happy and thriving. Even Wayne Niederhauser met her. You, I, I don't know if you met her, but Niederhauser met her. And when I sent him a picture of her after sh- her death, she was only homeless again for a day and a half when this happened. No kidding. You know, we had to wow. move out of the garden because the land was put up for sale. She ha- got a motor home and then she was house sitting and pet sitting, but then she was kicked out in the middle of the night and she was only homeless again for a day and a half um, when, you know, she she had a manic episode. It wasn't drug-induced, it wasn't meth, it was just, I tried so hard, had been housed for 10 months, and bam, back as though, you know, the past 10 months hadn't happened. Wow. You know, but um, well, she was so stable and happy when we were living as a community. We were making food together every night. We were going out and serving together and hanging around the, the fi- around the fire and going to the lake together and things. Well, it's that, like everybody yeah. I think wants to improve their situation, yeah. but I I think the system that's in place now, it's it feels like it's uh, designed to keep people on the bottom. I mean, it is. The, it, of course. It, why is it? Why do you think it is this? You've been well, studying this for a while. First of all, I want to say this about Megan Mullen, and, yeah. and I know what dear friends you were and how, what yeah. great support you were, Ksenia, of Megan. She is not with us today because the police absolutely failed to de escalate, and instead they chose to escalate the situation because she wouldn't give them her name. 
Yeah, yeah, it that's right. Far we too often. That footage earlier. The other man, he obviously had some mental health issues that was going into the brewery, we had, just had his shorts on. Police held him down. He died because earlier, uh, another police department, they dealt with him. They de escalated. They tried to deal with him. Here, there was this confrontation that had to get physical. Police got on him and he died. This is mm-hmm. two people in, during the course of a year. There's been zero accountability for it. I, I don't know. And then you hear the mayor, when she, she either won't address it or when the police go out and there's a black man on the, on the floor of an elevator bleeding to death and the two police officers standing there for over eight minutes waiting for an ambulance to come rather than exercising <coughs> their training in first aid. They never touched him, never put any pressure on they didn't do anything for him, and the mayor and the chief of police both have said they support those two officers, these two first responders. When was that? I didn't, I didn't hear about that. For not doing a thing was to help this man, and he died two. He died two hours later. Yeah, his name was Ryan Outlaw, hmm. African American. Uh, Channel Thirteen did a, a, has done a tremendous series of exposés on this. Internal Affairs actually cleared these first responders for not doing one thing to help save his life, and now it's before the Civilian Review Board. By the way, if you look up the Civilian Review Board online, you'll find that there are 15, no, yes, 16 vacancies out of 21 seats on the Civilian Review Board. Take a look. Why is that? Because we don't have management at the top in the mayor's office. I made certain that our boards and commissions were full, that we went out and recruited people, that we diversified the membership on all our boards and commissions. This Mendenhall administration has done a absolutely dismal job of filling our boards and commissions and of diversifying the membership on those boards and commissions. Well, the, the most telling um lack of data that I'm finding and I just am appalled that that these people are considered like homeless advocates or trying to solve the problem is that there's no record keeping of homeless deaths. Yeah. I, I'm just amazed by this because back in uh, July, we first heard this rumor there's a homeless ser- serial killer. Yeah. Um, you, that there's these bodies, I hear it women. Every day on the streets. Okay. Yeah. Still. But, so, but so, those yeah. rumors without yeah. factual basis but, so, are very yeah. dangerous. So. My, my contention is that the serial killer is, is drugs. I, 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 that's what I believe. But so why not keep track, at least, of how homeless people are dying? Why yeah. not keep track of their death numbers? Why not have use the measure of your success as a homeless administrator as yeah. okay, how many people died this week? How did they die? Yeah. How could we how could we have prevented their deaths? That they're not keeping that data? I just find that absolutely appalling. It, we it, is, it is appalling, but it's I, just I reflective think of how I, little they care about people. I, I the think the fundamental metric yeah. for any of these people and you've seen recently the disclosure of how many millions upon millions of dollars these homeless providers have in mm-hmm. assets. Why are these people not sheltered? Why, when when Erin Mendenhall, our mayor, made a big deal out of this, she, she had a press conference, I've signed an emergency declaration allowing 25 more people to be housed in both of the resource centers in Salt Lake City. Do you know how many that on, at last check, and this was weeks after she signed this emergency declaration, there were 55 fewer beds in these two resource centers than were allowed by the state and by the city. So, in fact, that emergency declaration that, that, that got her so much publicity, the media mm-hmm. doesn't ever seem to follow up except yeah. people like you, frankly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't ask the question, so what difference did that yeah. emergency declaration actually mean? She got money, right? So that's 55 people that have been freezing out on the streets, suffering, to, and, and not just the deaths. People have been losing toes because of frostbite, because of a combination of diabetes and and frostbite. It is pure suffering. It's hell for these people. And all these these 
good folks like Cassinia and, and Wendy Garvin and Carl <coughs> Moore. You can't, you, you sh- I shouldn't start naming them because there are so, so many, many great people mm-hmm. that are volunteering <coughs> to help. But they're doing, they pulled off at the Methodist Church what the city has failed and yeah. refused to do and, in fact, tried to prevent people from doing with over 80 people coming in and getting fed, getting cared for, and having a place to sleep yeah, it's, on it's, these bitter winter it's nights. It's like, uh, like this one church really stepping up in a major way. You could imagine the impact that could happen if all the churches <laughs> yeah. stepped up. And that's kind of what I... Mean like I just want to say... Yeah, what, what are all the ones yeah. in the basketball courts, the, the <laughs> multi-purpose know. centers and giant kitchens? I mean, where are you? Showers, where are they? bathrooms... I, I just, And I want to say that we mobilized in hours to open it up on that Thursday. Um, I think Wendy made the call and she had coalesced some of the other organizations together saying, you know, we need manpower. How are we going to, there might be an opportunity for this church to open doors. And she got the go ahead at three o'clock. By 8 p.m., we had open doors. You and I were there together. Yeah. That is yeah. So and awesome. it was, and so, yeah, it was wild for those first four inaugural days, a trial period, so that it could become, you know, a permanent installation. But even, you know, and understandably, the church wanted to see how it would work. And it's, it's still a functioning before. church every yeah, Sunday. Yeah, and it's and still a functioning church. And you wouldn't be surprised. I mean, in the morning um, when the, a building facilitator comes in, I mean, those first few days, we were just giggle on the floor about how, like, he couldn't even believe anything happened here that last night. Like, really? it was so spick and span and clean, you couldn't even tell that there was 85 people snoring. And, and how this, many square was, foot of, how <laughs> feet of church yeah. space do we and have? Just he did it at night. Yeah, really? just not, one yeah. part of this they church. Could, and it's not a basketball lives. court. This and, is yeah. a carpeted area of the church yeah. that's meant for church services and yeah. all the rest. Really? This is without one cent of... Government, government funding, funding yeah. and All nobody, not neighbor. one person from city or county government has come over to volunteer. I've not seen one person Thanks, from Troy. any of the homeless providers come over and volunteer. Oh, I do have to say Andrew Johnson did show up, I think, on night three, main four, mainly because we, we had been transporting. We had a, a Honda CRV that has like 360,000 miles on it. The driver's side door won't open. And one of our volunteers, <laughs> Mello... He just picked, he'd been on the streets for months before that, solidifying relationships. And he ended up clearing the entire weekend single-handedly by just having people pile into this, you know, barely, barely chugging along Honda and bringing them over to the church saying, cajoling them, look, you don't want to freeze tonight. Um... And I've never seen the Wigan like crickets. I mean, there was not one person sleeping there. No kidding. Um, and then you know, and what? then, so what and then our and the then advantage? our Honda and then our Honda like pooped out and it was transporting so many people. It stopped working for the fourth night, and then finally, and I'd been begging Andrew Johnson, like, can we help help providing transport? I mean, there's people so are gonna freeze and tonight, Johnson. and finally. He showed up with his own truck pr- transporting a few loads, I think. He he but is the communications get... director for the the mayor. Yeah, he's, the right? homeless, he's the homeless kind of czar for, for the, the, the mayor. city. Yeah, and and he seems like a great guy. Why is his? He, I mean, he's helping with the with solving the problem, but why mm. is his initiative, his line of thinking, not? going up to the top. No, he right? helped get transportation one night. Oh, one night. that's what he no, did. And oh, out of his own truck. That's he, after Cassinia. Yeah. yeah. After, oh, Cassinia, God, after, after our car, like, and I shamed them. <laughs> Look, we have this car that was, like, you know, really should not be driving, and we're doing it all we can. Yeah. And I'd been asking for the city, you know, Wendy has to, for days to help provide transport. Nothing. And then finally, it's like, well, city can't do anything, but I'll show up with my truck. And you can you can show loads. up with the yeah. front end loaders and I the dump know. trucks to move Move them no, out know, and, and harass them, but, but to transport them, them to a church, to, you can't do that. Yeah, so that That's they stay warm. So it's insane. I, I, you know, because of people dying. And, and this tragedy of people being in the freezing cold, that's right in front of us now. And that's what, like, the legislature was focusing on that with some new legislation uh, so that other counties would take some of this pressure off during winter nights. And then they came up with the cold blue proposal mm-hmm. that you mm-hmm. take everybody in. But only when it hits 15 degrees. Yeah. It's killer weather above 15 yeah, degrees. Yeah, you can, and there's you no can money die associated with degrees, the cold right? blue. The How point I wanted to make is let's not be projecting for next winter anything other than having people in housing. 
and having at the very least a central sanctioned camp area yes. where people are safe from police raids yes. and where you have showers and toilets. I've been on a That's, crusade for yeah. years to get public toilets and this yeah. mayor and the council member I, were de- I was dealing with, they had zero care or concern for all of the people who don't have access to bathrooms when they need to relieve themselves. And that is considered internationally a basic human right, right to sanitation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have denied that every way they can, saying, mm-hmm. oh, we'll send somebody out, Advantage Services, to clean it up after the fact. That is how little they care about human dignity, about personal hygiene, and mm-hmm. about what the rest of us. Let's talk about compassion for businesses and residents of our community that suffer the consequences of these failures relating to homelessness policy. Because they're the ones that, I mean, people have to relieve themselves somewhere. They're the ones that are going to have it in their yards, on their steps, uh, downtown city streets, in our alleys, and the encampments Mm -hmm. everywhere, including in our parks. We need to get rid of those encampments and let people have a safe place. Yeah, let's take a look at, for one second, what the legislature did. Um, this is House Bill 499 I've got up on screen. Homeless Very service long. amendments. It's, it is long, but I want to point out just a few things. Um, a winter response, county winter response task force for the purpose of preparing county winter response plan um, describes the membership of the, of the county winter response task force. So uh, money appropriated to this bill, none. I found that kind of striking. Yeah. So how does this bill have any teeth at all? Well, that's the or thing. How the, what does it really mean? Spell- how I mean, can you, they You understand people? this probably better than better than we do. Is this, what, what does this do? What does this mean? Well, it, it, what it means is they're imposing these requirements on counties, <laughs> but not, as, as usual, not funding it. It's like an unfunded mandate that, mm-hmm. that our legislature always complains about when the federal government does it but it, it's 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 really not that different from Aaron Mendenhall saying by emergency decree oh we're going to allow yeah. 25 more people in each of the two resource centers in Salt Lake we're, we're without we, expanding staff. isn't that yeah. ma- magnanimous of us yeah. that we're yeah. going to allow and you we're calling to do it that? an emergency yeah. finally people but, are dying we're going to call it an emergency but yeah. But then and they all say we can't do it, do it because we don't have the funding yeah. for staffing. Mm-hmm. Nobody funded it. Yeah. So the mayor comes out and looks like she did something that was meaningful. Again, it was just a performative. It was, it but was a, insubstantial. A little it bit of pushback no on, on, the, world. on the mayor, um, the blaming the mayor completely. The legislature also passed a provision that they'll provide continuous additional funding for homeless services for Salt Lake City as long as they mandate the no camping, no camping ordinance, ordinances. enforce the yes. camp. So if she if she opens, were to say, yeah. like, okay, I'm going to stop these uh, these abatements, whatever. I mean, they're they're obviously worse than that. But you you wouldn't she then be risking losing funding from the state legislature? The, the point is, and, and, and this is why I have a problem with the ACLU or any other lawyers not coming to the aid of, of the homeless population right now, it's unconstitutional mm-hmm. to deny people a place if you don't have an alternative for them. You can't just keep doing this, pushing them out of one place or another or giving them citations for violating the no camping ordinances if you don't have another place. That's at least under Ninth Circuit law, and I think we'd find the same if any lawyers would pick up this case. Mm -hmm. And I've been pushing the ACLU. They finally wrote one apparently toothless letter after I'd been pushing them after that one raid at the Spaghetti Bowl Mm -hmm. because I'd established... There, there was no place in the shelters. There, nobody had provided any alternative places for these people to go, and they were still moved out of there by the police, by the streets division, and by the contractor for the city what, advantage services. What I find so interesting is you buy a bus for four thousand yeah. dollars. If there were a fleet of buses, yeah. like I, I, I don't like, I don't like pe- homeless people camping. 
anywhere yeah. either. I don't think anybody does, and nobody wants that. But if there's no alternative, what else are they going to do? Exactly. You buy a bus for four thousand dollars. Why not have a fleet of buses yeah. saying, "Okay, I'm sorry, we have to enforce no camping, but yeah. you get to stay in this bus tonight. Yeah. We're going to get you into." Uh, overflow or a, mm -hmm. a, a voucher for housing, mm -hmm. but there's none of that. There's there's, none there's of that. no volunteers or caseworkers showing up, telling yeah. these people where they can go, mm -hmm. how they can get warm for the night. They're just scattered, and then they go into flight and fight or flight mode. And I'm sure that's terrible for your mental health. I'm oh sure that gosh. makes you want to use more drugs. Yeah, and they and end it up just makes staying their up all night worse. trying to figure out where else they're scouting new properties. Where are they going to move in the morning? You know, thinking about. Who's going to watch their things and then packing up. And so by the morning, when all the tensions are heightened and there's these men in suits just standing there, you know, growling at them and they hadn't eaten all day because they were trying to figure out where to move. I mean, imagine those there's there's a lot of like a, a lot of domestic violence that happens in situations, you know, abatements. There's a lot of like mental health breakdowns. Yeah, it's just it's, awful. I can't imagine really go, living through that. But but Rocky, what would you provide? What would be the solution? What would you enact? Well, the, the, You're running for mayor. I want everybody to know that. Yes. Rocky, who was our our I would say from all the from all the small business owners I've talked to and I talked to dozens and dozens, probably hundreds, they all say Rocky's the best mayor we've had in Salt Lake City. And uh, I'm really happy you're running again. Well, thank you. I appreciate um, that. And, yeah. and you and it, you ran two consecutive four year terms, correct? I did. And now yeah. you're, you're two thousand to two thousand eight. And yeah. I'm running again because I see an utter failure of leadership. Mm -hmm. in the mayor's office and it has tragic consequences not only for people in the homeless community but for residents and businesses alike and we become an incredibly unaffordable community and now there's a scurry of activity you'll notice now that she's in the middle of a campaign she's going from one ribbon cutting to another and and she runs out and talks about how much she cares about the homeless out at the the other side village but at the same time, she's treating these people worse than we would treat our companion animals. Dogs. If somebody were treating dogs <laughs> like this and leaving them out in the cold and taking away their survival equipment, mm -hmm. they'd yeah, be no reported way. to the ASPCA yeah, exactly. or the Humane Society. Mm -hmm. So um, y you asked what I would do. For this problem right now, no question. I've said this from day one. We need a central sanction camp, perhaps more than one, because yeah, you want families with yeah. children separated from the rest, but a place where uh, members of the homeless community are safe from police raids, mm -hmm. where they can settle in one place, and they have rules and regulations. Uh, they're, they're, it would be secured. They'd be searched when they come in, no drugs, and, but they're free to leave. It's not a prison. Mm -hmm. And it would be very much like what they have down in San Antonio called the courtyard at the Haven for Hope, where you can come in just so you're not camping, you're not setting up your tents in, in the parks and, and people and the parking strips and on Main Street. I've been down there and people have been in camp between planters on Main Street. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a disservice to everybody in the community. And members of the homeless community, I know Cassini would, would, has heard this, they know that they're very sensitive about the way they're viewed by other people in the community. And this certainly doesn't help when there are these encampments all around. So provide one place, toilets. We ought to have public toilets anywhere, accessible to anybody yeah. who need to relieve themselves in this community. We used to have a beautiful, by the way, public toilet right there at 3rd South and Main Street on the southwest corner. Marble, like one of the, is like a subway entrance mm. in New York. Hmm. You go down, gorgeous bathrooms available for men and women. I didn't know that. Yeah, we, oh. yeah, the pictures of it. I couldn't even get this mayor. First of all, she foisted me, former two-term mayor. I don't, I don't expect better treatment than anybody else. I just expect that everybody gets better treatment than I did from our own mayor. When I'm pointing out these problems, in terms of the treatment and the condition of the homeless people just outside my building on Main Street and 3rd South, and then the problems with human feces and urine. Mm -hmm. We'd be greeted with puddles of urine every day walking into our building. 
Well, what happens? That pits business owners or residents against members of the homeless community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They blame them. Yeah. No, they have to relieve themselves. That's like blaming a dog for having to relieve himself when you don't provide another place. Yeah. That is the mayor's responsibility. Focus any anger or resentment you have on the mayor who f- has totally failed and refused to pursue the common sense solutions. You could have attended so what about the, what toilets. about the nimbyism? Like the I, I keep hearing about the sanctioned campground and now Pioneer Park Coalition, now called Utah Solutions, they're saying, okay, we got funding. There's funding for a sanctioned campground now. Now we just have to find the real estate. We know Utah and Salt Lake is run by developers slash yeah. politicians. Yeah. How yeah. are you going to possibly find that real estate where you're going to get that okay. buy-in from the community? Uh, okay, first of all, let's agree on the concept and, and as part of the concept in a place that's going to have the, the most minimal, if no effect, on residents and businesses. And there are those places. Yeah, we could set it up. Bowl. The Spaghetti Bowl is a yeah, perfect Camp example. Lasto. They They weren't mm-hmm. bothering anybody. Greyhound. They went around mm-hmm. and talked to businesses that were even quite a distance it away. See, it seems like, saying, especially the ones you mentioned, there. I didn't know of any business owners complaining about the there. Yeah, there. They, there I mean, there's there's no businesses around there. Those places are but vacant that's like, under rail, railroad. That's like Union Pacific and, yeah. land. That could Nobody that somehow it, be, get approved? I mean, you you know the legislative process behind that, or the of course, the uh, I mean any any kind, especially in a freezing weather going into a, a winter. Hopefully, we don't have the same mayor in place, and we can immediately find shelter yeah. for those in the homeless community. And it, it, if they prefer to be in tents and and then you could get that sanctioned campground. But I also think there are plenty of warehouses. There are plenty of places we could find that, like the courtyard in San Antonio, you could put pads down on the floor. They've got lockers where you can store your property. Yeah. But right now, what happens? You pitch your tent. You're just trying to find a place to exist. Mm-hmm. You have a job. Then you get a warning that they're gonna come and they're gonna raid and they're gonna take your property if you're not there and, and get your stuff out of there. So you, you can't go to work. I talked to a guy who has two temporary jobs and a part-time job. And the part-time job was at Vivint Arena. I've met two people that are employed at Vivint Arena mm-hmm. that are living yeah, in town. few too. They can't show up at work yeah. because they're too busy trying to save their property from somebody stealing it when they're gone. Mm-hmm. So you, a sanctioned camp yeah. would provide that security. Yeah. You yeah. could leave your things. You can go to work. Yeah. You know, let's stop treating members of the homeless community as if they're helpless because most of them are not. They want a better life. They, and the rest of our community deserves what we would find and that is no encampments in our parks and elsewhere in our community if we would pursue those solutions. So you've got residents, you've got businesses, you've got visitors to our city, and you've got members of the homeless community. All of their interests converge on the same solutions, and these are the solutions that the mayor has rejected. And she absolutely did not tell the truth. That's putting it lightly on a podcast recently when she said, well, I haven't objected. I haven't opposed sanction camps. I've just said we're not going to own and operate them as a city, even though this, this problem is a city problem, and she's the mayor, and yeah. we, by damn, we ought to own and well, operate the more, them. The moratorium that she, the yeah. city but, council passed on anything like that. But she's not yeah. telling the truth. She has absolutely opposed it. She was quoted in the newspaper yeah. saying, quote, heck no, there will be no sanctioned camps in Salt Lake City, close quote. Yeah. Now, she keeps trying to run away from her positions when she figures out that there's a lot of opposition. But still, the proof's in the pudding. She what? wants the sanctioned camp in the county somewhere yeah. or somewhere she south or north. She, or hasn't, south yeah. she hasn't suggested but a sanctioned camp anywhere. All, all she really. said is, now, now after she said she was against it, she finally said after some reporters went to Denver and saw how well it worked. Mm-hmm. She said, well, maybe it'd be okay, but it, it, we're not going to take it on. Yeah. It's, it's going to require county and state leadership. She just, by that statement, showed 
the obvious, and that, that is that she does not and cannot apparently provide the leadership that the city needs. I will do it. And when you talk about those business owners, I've talked to a lot of folks, Republicans as well as Democrats, independents. They say, you know, we might have had problems with your politics, like my opposition to the Iraq war or my opposition to Bush's human rights and civil rights violations at the time. Yeah, they, they saw that through a partisan lens. But every one of them tell me, including some Republicans up uh, on the Hill, Rocky, we know that you can provide the leadership. You're a strong leader, and you get things done. Well, and you talk to people. The, yeah. I mean, like, He's yeah. action if, oriented. if, He's if always I ever serving saw the, community. the mayor yeah. talking to a homeless person yeah. legitimately and having a conversation, I would totally give her kudos for yeah. doing that. And I haven't seen it. And I think but going, Rocky's just out going there out and talking to people is, is yeah. the most valuable source of information. Like, you can have your your cabinet or your city council but that insulates you from the truth. Yeah. And I think that she's insulated herself from the truth of the situation, which is that people are dying. They're not keeping track of the deaths. They're, they're yeah. trying to bury this. Yeah. They're trying to make it so you can't see them and hide yeah. them during big events. Mm -hmm. And it's totally inhumane. And I think that the, the main problem that I see is, is there is a disconnect between the state and the city. This is a, yeah. why, this is a bigger issue than just Salt Lake City. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like the the state leadership wants to provide any financing mm -hmm. unless she's doing a better job at, at preventing camping. Yeah. But if you don't also provide a sanctioned campground, where are the, where the hell are people supposed to go? Yeah, it just, exactly. Yeah. And it, let me... it, you're right. And, <laughs> and, but it goes beyond, we're talking about immediate needs right? because that is what's right in front of us. But let's look long term. When I was mayor, and I don't take credit for this, there were a lot of people collaborating and, and putting together, either renovating or building permanent housing for chronically homeless people mm -hmm. with wraparound services. And they were getting, especially people with disabilities, elderly people, we were getting people into housing with those services and it was working. And then it all, I, I think we started because I think we were kind of smoking our own dope, mm -hmm. as the expression goes. Yeah. When we were saying we were conquering homelessness, you see in Mother Jones, NPR, LA Times, writings. Oh, the Daily Show you, with John Stewart. Utah has came. conquered homelessness. 91% yeah. of chronically homeless people mm -hmm. are off the streets now. And I think people started believing that, and we dropped the ball. And, and this was after I was mayor. But it almost all came to a screeching halt. And then what happened? We saw, we saw these folks building places like Magnolia, $263,000 per unit, and putting people who weren't ready for independent living with the idea that, oh, we give them four walls in a fancy, expensive place and a door, and that's going to somehow solve the problem when you have prostitution going on there, you have drug dealing going on. Try to be, try to get in a drug program and get over your addiction when your next door neighbor's a drug dealer and everybody else on your floor is partying at night and doing drugs. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening at the Magnolia. I've heard it not only from employees there, I've also heard it from tenants. Well, yeah. it's, it's interesting because the, the organization that runs Magnolia, Palmer Court, is the road home. Yeah. They don't want to talk about the problem either. They would. They don't want to address it head on, and and I'm and I'm like, okay, it's not like we want to smear you or say that this was all your fault, but if you're not willing to talk about it and you're not willing to address what you're going to do to solve the problem, how are you going to stop it from happening? What what would be your solution to, to cleaning up Magnolia, Palmer Court, all the resource centers? from being infested with, with drugs yeah. and, and sex trafficking in the neighborhoods? Well, I, if I can interject, I think we need something lower barrier. We need a place, I mean, we need an interim place for people to go from the streets that is, you know, a, a step, a little toe in the water of the rules and the regulations of us average Joes who have to comply with a society. Mm -hmm. Those rules don't necessarily exist out in the streets. So that's why sanctioned campgrounds are so effective is, look, if someone, you know, can't take care of their personal property, cannot keep their, you know, their tent clean, 
cannot, you know, uh, because well, mental illness somebody, is really rampant. And we can, yeah, or someone's on drugs and they're smoking in there. You can easily replace a tent. It's a lot easier than renovating a two hundred sixty-five thousand, you know, dollar apartment. Mm. So people need a safe place, just super low barrier, free place to land, a place to stabilize until they can let go of the crutches that were keeping them upright and going and warm and not hungry out Do you in the agree street. With that, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and then two, you know, a sanctioned campground. One second, sorry, sir. Mm-hmm. Um, a sanctioned campground in Missoula. In the first six months of their sanctioned campground, they placed more people in permanent supportive housing than the previous two years of the status quo combined. And that's what we're finding as social service providers, how hard it is for us to get people into housing when we lose people all the time and we don't know where they're at. And they're they're abated and one week they're here and then another week we don't know and they lose their phones, they don't have phones. And it's, it's chaos and it's a crisis. I don't understand how the system is purported to be better than all these other solution-oriented you know, ideas like you know, Rocky and, and other people have been promoting. It just makes no sense to me. And another thing is when Kennedy shut down the asylums, he tasked the communities to take care of the people with the gravest mental illnesses among us. And we have failed. We did not set up an adequate community response. The people are going to break in their head. They're going to break in their bodies. And that is our social safety net, our social contracts to take care of people who cannot take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. And right now, our streets are the old asylums. But at least, you know, with all of the hell that the asylums were, at least there was a roof over their head and maybe some meals. Mm-hmm. Too often, jails and prisons yeah. are now the and that's places exactly of first it. resort. And you know mm-hmm. what? In Price, I just picked up a guy from um, Carbon County Jail, um, one of our sexy Noma calendar models, and he said his cellmate had been stranded in Price. He couldn't find anyone. He was begging people to give him a job, give him a place to stay. It was really cold. He went to the jail. They turned him away. So he went to the convenience store and stole just so that he could be warm that night and have several meals a day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that is that is the huge gap that everybody is 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 ignoring is you talk to the people who are in the resource centers, they can't get a night's sleep because the people next to them are screaming out of the middle of the night. Like the Gerald E. King Center especially, I've heard that story over and over, over again. And over. Like Every you, you have women in there who should absolutely be in a mental hospital. And they scream out in the middle of the night. They they do things like urinate all over the place and masturbate in the middle of the night and scream while they're doing it. And it's like it's it sounds like you're in an insane asylum when you're supposed to be in the one place sanctioned by the state and the city where you're supposed to get back on your feet. And I would never want to stay there. Mm -hmm. and, And this is a charge of the county. And the county has done a horrible job when it comes to providing mental health services and so we do end up with a lot of mentally ill people in our prisons and jails Uh, why can't uh, so this is all across the united states and every municipality the the mental condition of people i think has gotten is deteriorated since covid Mm -hmm. but why can't counties um heal these people or help these people as it was deemed by when Kennedy did shut down the mental institutions that that they would take control of that why can't we solve that problem why is that not in my backyard over and over again for centuries (laughs) decades terrible leadership at the top it's not been a priority and uh, it's certainly I I know that the the mayor of the county is now scurrying trying to raise money and they're going to try to put a mental health facility out by the jail. But um, she, I ran across one night, this guy, it was freezing weather, it was 30 degrees, it was gonna get colder. I just come out of my gym, right across from the city and county building, by the way. Um, He was in stocking feet in a wheelchair and he wasn't gonna budge. And I went up to him, talked to him, he was very aggressive at first. I said, you gotta get inside, you're gonna freeze out here tonight. And it was, clear, it was clearly as a result of his mental illness that he was refusing to go inside. I got him some coffee, donuts. I called police. They weren't going to come. And I said, well, this man's going to die. So I need to know what the dispatcher's name is so I can let the media know tomorrow after this man dies who, who refused oh, to, to send somebody out. Yeah. So they sent somebody out. And I was up most of the night. I was getting him. Uh, I went home, got him some Uggs that I had to put on his feet. We got... 
we got clothing. I, I, we and the and the police officer was so torn by it. And I said, y- "Your duty is to get. He, he's making this decision on the basis of his mental illness. So it's no different than him walking into a burning building because of his mental illness. You've got a duty to protect him." And he said, "Well, if I do, you'll probably sue me for Fourth Amendment violation for forcing him in to a shelter." And I called Uni. They said. It was called Uni at the time. Now it's the Huntsman Mental Institute. Mm-hmm. Um, they said we don't have the resources. I said, so you won't. You're the you're the main mental health institution here. Can't get the police to do it. Couldn't get the EMTs to do it. And this man, because of his mental illness, is going to perhaps die from freezing to death from exposure on our streets. So I went to the newspaper about it. They did an article, and. The mayor of the county, Jenny Wilson, basically said that, oh, I, I, I apparently am not aware they have really nice resource centers for people to go in. <laughs> Completely missing the point that this man knew there were resource centers. He refused to go in, and we need to deal with this, this difficult dilemma of what do we do? And you've heard the mayor of New York recently dealing with this. Mm -hmm. But I've been saying it for years. We've got to help people whose decisions are being made on the basis of their own mental illness. And it's not a matter of civil rights. I don't want to hear from the ACLU that you're going to stand so strongly for somebody's civil liberties when their decision is, could lead to their own death, mm-hmm. or it could lead to, to yeah, harm for other people. Yeah, that's a tough one. But Rocky, yeah. this so, is, this so is what, where we the disagree. Guys, did the guy end up being saved, and he did, where did he yeah, go? Yeah, because we took care of him yeah, throughout you, the night, yeah. but I don't know what happened to him the next day. <coughs> Yeah, and I know Cassinia and That's I, why I don't I disagree, because Rocky, I'm mostly sane, and I probably would be that person out in a snowstorm rather than going into a shelter myself. I don't think I would ever choose a shelter of my own volition. No, I'm talking about get the mental health treatment, you, yeah, not what, shoved uh, what into if, a shelter. What if it yeah. were like a, if there were, again, say, a thousand bed mental yeah. health facility, it, it wouldn't that be much, much better than what we've got right now? Of course, yep. of course, yeah. but we don't have that, and so I think, you know, so if are we some, in agreement if, then? <laughs> yeah. No, I just don't think that he should be forced to go into a shelter where we're we're missing the point. The shelter system is broken, and that is our only alternative right now. People are choosing a tent for the privacy, that and the stability and the freedom that it affords. We and the the real problem is is we have to have other alternatives to the shelter system otherwise we'll still have camps don't misconstrue my position i wasn't saying force him into a shelter it's that he didn't want to be in a shelter is the reason he wouldn't budge Mm -hmm. he needed mental health treatment yeah and we as a community like we would for any of our great friends or family members we would do what we could to get somebody with mental health issues that are so serious that it leads to decision-making that puts their lives at risk. Mm-hmm. We do that for our own family members, yet all these people call them our brothers and sisters on the street. They don't act like they're our brothers yeah. and sisters when they're going to turn their backs to them and just say, oh, that's his decision, let him freeze to death. Well, it, it's like, again, we talked about at the beginning of the program, um, your chant, Jesus was a homeless man, yeah. reminding people of the Jesus character of Jesus. Homeless. You think about the parable of the lost sheep. Yeah. I, I read the book of Luke, and that parable is uh, a shepherd has 90, 100 sheep, and he would risk the 99 to go get the one who's lost. Yeah. And that's how I believe Christians see everybody, not just the other Christians, all of humanity. And if we're, if we're not actively seeking the lost sheep and trying to help the ones that are in need, wh- how can we call ourselves Christians? Or followers exactly. of what what he established. Yeah, and I you know, I have a problem with people equating humanitarian kind conduct toward others with 
just being Christians. Yeah, but I, I, I know so many people, yeah. so yeah. many people I, use that label, but it, it, they forget who he was. They forget yeah. what he said. So I, I like You're to right. read the Bible to just remind people. Yeah, read Saint there's, Matthew. There's plenty Saint of Matthew. words of Jesus Christ yeah. to, saying what you should do with your your poor and your hungry and yeah. your needy, and and it's like it's we're not doing it. I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry yeah. and you, 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 you fed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I was in prison and you visited me. That's Saint Matthew. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't care about somebody's religion. Every single religious tradition and humanitarian tradition, you don't have to be religious, mm-hmm. says you take care of people who are in need. And this city, I, I've said it before, we are at our moral lowest point in our history, given the treatment by our city government. Yeah. Toward those who are most in need. Yeah, six, I agree. Six or, well, I guess seven people that we know of that have died from the elements. Everybody else out there suffering. And the mayor doing her social media photos and all of that and, and trying to take credit for, the, like, the other side village, which was not her doing. That was Joseph Grenny and the other side academy folks who came up with this. And their model was... Uh, community first village outside of Austin. I've been there. The mayor hasn't even bothered to visit any of these model but projects. She went to Florida, Rocky. Yeah, she went to Florida <laughs> where they had a whiteboard and they were they they heard from prosecutors. And she took like and ten police. people with her. Yeah, she including took a whole some wealthy entourage. campaign. I don't know why that couldn't have been a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and that was during a, a, a freezing time. Yeah, here I remember when so many people were on the yeah. street and people like mm-hmm. Ksenia here out there helping them. And, and you're right, you, people do not understand the depth of this problem and the depth of, of the suffering by these individuals unless, you know, I just encourage everybody, get out there and get to know, get to, get to really know the others. And members of our homeless community, go down and volunteer. If the Methodist Church is open again, Go down and do it. I brought in four people the other night who had never been there before. They were absolutely inspired and uplifted mm-hmm. at the end of that evening. And you we can worked volunteer our through. Yeah. Off well, let, our yeah, blue bus is about, operating twenty four seven. We always need help. So I you can would. get you can become oh. a you can sign up to be a volunteer for yeah, Nomad Alliance yeah. on your on your website. Yeah, you sure can. Nomadalliance.org. Um, also on our Facebook page. A Nomad Alliance private Facebook group and Facebook page. And you can donate yeah, there all the time. And you can donate as well on our website. Cool. And, and, there, yeah. and we can also get new leadership in Salt Lake City government. Yeah. And it's not yeah. only in the I mayor's office. I think we office. definitely need it. We really need to take yeah. a look at these council races and which council members have just lined up blindly and never spoken up on behalf of those who are suffering the most because of the total failure of leadership yeah. in the mayor's office. So when when is the next uh, vote? November 7th. So November 7th is Yeah, there's is no primary be... apparently. They, they, the council's decided it's going to be ranked choice voting. Hmm. And uh, either way, I, I'm, we're, we're going to win this thing, but yeah. we've all got to do it together. This is something, forget about political affiliation. Stand up for what's right. Stand up for good leadership and uh, stand up for a community where we're all looking out for each other. Members of the homeless community, our businesses, we've had businesses leave Salt Lake City directly because of the problems with the homelessness situation. An officer was talking to me off the record um, that he knows of several businesses that are getting ready to leave Yep. Because it hasn't improved. I'm meeting with an owner tomorrow of a business that I, I've known them since I was practicing law many, many years ago. And, sh- and she's <coughs> she's going to le- move her business outside of Salt Lake City because of the kinds of things yes. that have happened. And, it, it, and, and again, you know, she's upset with the members of the homeless community that have engaged in certain kinds of conduct. But... <laughs> They were there and engaging in that kind of conduct because police are turning a blind eye to it. They're not dealing with it. And we don't have the help for the homeless community that is 
you see it in community after community around this country. This isn't just a given. People say, oh, look at San Francisco, look at L.A. Geez, isn't this a tough problem everybody's facing? No, other communities are stepping up and they're solving mm-hmm. these problems. Houston we can do it, too. Houston reduced theirs 65% mm-hmm. in yeah. just a few short years. Yeah, well, we have to definitely make changes, and, and more people need to know what's going on. It's yeah. why we keep covering this. It's why I, I, it's it's like... I think all, all of our time. our our passion projects, it's like this is the worst I've ever seen it in Salt Lake. And so um, I just want to encourage everybody watching, go visit the Nomad Alliance. Yeah. Go visit, was it Rocky for Mayor? Rockyformayor.com. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and get involved. Know, get to know homeless people. Get to yeah. know what, what these people are going through and talk to them. They really appreciate it when you just sit and talk to them, even more than just giving them a handout or food. If you get to know them and know their case and know what they're dealing with and uh, get to know them, I think you're going to learn how you can help in, in, in a major way and what needs to be done. And so thank you so much, everyone, for watching. If you could share this episode with a friend, that could be the best way we can get this out. Um, We've had a lot of people subscribe to our magazine. That also helps a lot to provide the voice of local Utah in print where we're not censored. We mentioned how earlier we were hit with a community strike violation very mysteriously by YouTube. We don't know why, but we were offline for two weeks and uh, never given an explanation. The way we can prevent any big tech censorship from happening is to subscribe to the Utah Stories magazine. Just go to utahstories.com and hit the subscribe button and or subscribe to our free digital newsletter. If you if you don't want a print subscription, that works, too. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for having us on. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah, Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. if I, the, love if, I love you. I love you. If the me, if the media doesn't.